I chose living unconventionally because my entire life, I don't know about any of you, but growing up as a girl in Uganda, you are told to choose. You have to be one thing. You have to choose to be a wife. You have to choose to be whatever your career dictates. You either have to choose to be a mother, and you basically have to put your wants and needs behind everyone else's to be considered acceptable, unconventional. So I did what most people don't. I became everything I ever wanted to be as a little girl. Okay, so I did things on my terms. And it was, to begin with, it was a disaster. I faced criticism from the family. I, I faced criticism from my friends. I basically, I never did it right. So I gave my father the one gift he wanted. My father, I don't know about any of you, but he is an outstanding engineer. And he wanted me to become one. Sooner you might as well clap, because daddy might know about this. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so I went to, um, to university and I decided to do one rebellious thing. I wouldn't do civil engineering like him. I would do chemical engineering because it had cosmetics in it. And every woman would have a good lipstick. So that was my thing. I went to university. I graduated really well at the top of my class. And I became a process engineer in the middle of nowhere in the U.S. So I went off and I worked on U.S. military contracts. So I'm quite handy with a gun and explosives. Just for the gentlemen out there, if that adds on to my street cred. Anyway, so I did that for about five years before I was discovered in a Walmart by Steve Jobs himself. Um, they were launching the Apple um, iPods at the time, and I was in my finest pajamas. I had gone to pick up a sandwich. I was hangover. And I have an afro, but it wasn't combed. So I thought, you know what? Who does it better than Tina Turner? I don't have her legs, but I'll play her music. So I was dancing to private dancer. And this skinny guy kept staring at me. So I thought I'd address him. And I told him I don't do porn. Just up front there, you know, I flicked my hair and said, I don't do porn. Okay? So he looked at me like I was a little nuts. And I thought, message across. I'll head out. In the parking lot, he gave me his card and he said, you know what? I think you have the look for something that I would like to do. So I looked at it and I don't like news because it's depressing. So I didn't know who Steve Jobs was until I got home. And my husband at the time, God rest his soul, took one look at it and said, oh my God, we're going to Los Angeles. I thought, really? So we went out there and there were like thousands of beautiful girls. I don't know if any of you have ever seen thousands of fantastic looking black women in every color, every body shape, just everyone is vying for one spot. And that is the time I looked at myself and I thought, um, why in God's name did he think I had something? I've never acted before. I don't think I'm that outstanding. But I had one thing that a lot of people didn't in that room. I didn't really care. You see, I was ready to risk it because I didn't care. I had nothing riding on it. So I got in that room and I flitted about the room because everyone else was dancing to the rhythm, you know? They played that U2 song and everyone got down like black people do. You know, we have that rhythm. It's instinctive. Everyone was, uh, was doing that. So I thought to myself, you know what? I can't be part of the masses. So I thought, I thought to myself, you know, White people get noticed when they dance stupid, so no offense. Are there any here? Okay, so I did, I did it, and it booked me the role of a lifetime. And I earned so much money from that ad, I thought, you know what? I can literally now just give up a 9 to 5 for a little while. I'm in my 20s. I am going to live it and love it. And that was my first definition of you have to do what you love. Every single time I went into those auditions, there were more beautiful girls, more stunning girls, more trained people. Every single one of those people in that room was better than me at it. But in my head, I believe I was indestructible. <laughs> you, know? you know when you wake up and you face people and they judge you from head to toe, your body shape, your skin color, your hair, everything is lacking and you have to make them believe. That is when you start to understand that you are going to have to give them something they've never seen before. So I did that for a while and I was okay. I worked in, I was Pepsi. I, I smiled a lot. I sold toothpaste. I sold 
sodas, and I was really making a lot of money. And then I'd given up on my engineering, but then I got lucky. I basically um, got pregnant with my first child. And then I was told my husband had cancer at the time. So I gave birth to my daughter, and her hus my husband died about a year later. So that was the turning point in my life. And I decided to come home. But I just shot one of the biggest motion pictures, Star Trek. And everyone was talking to me about the sequel and how amazing it will be if I could do it. And as I lay on the table after giving birth and someone offered me liposuction to look perfect again, I just realized that life is what you choose and it's not what you expect. So I took a risk and I came home. And on arrival at home, it was like Uganda had just discovered oil. <laughs> so I slipped into a job and I was lucky. I bullshitted my way through the interview, like, you know. Um, I told them I'd worked in Alaska. My, my boss isn't here, is he? So I told them I'd worked on a rig in Alaska. I had researched the lingo. And being an actress, guess what? I pulled it off. <laughs> I don't think the people at Tello Oil still know that I never worked at Alaska. Please don't do that. Don't tell them. It would be so horrible for me. So I slipped into a job, but it was an amazing opportunity. I was part of the team that is responsible for giving Uganda the 2.9 billion barrels of oil in reserves that we have. And it's been an outstanding journey. It really has. It's like, you know, you, you come from this country that everyone belittles. You know, Uganda was never meant, on, on the international stage, no one talked positively about Uganda. There was always some sort of trauma, some sort of uh, tragedy. And then they discovered oil, and then Kiprotik won gold. <laughs> By the way, I was there for that one. <laughs> Woo! That, anyway. So, um, so he won gold, and we discovered oil, and I worked. Now I'm still with the same oil company. We're trying to get it to development. But, you know, you can't sit... I don't know, nine to fives, it's fantastic if you can concentrate all that time, but I have this ADD thing that goes on. So I was working, and then I had this idea. What if I could watch TV on my laptop without anyone knowing? And what if it was wholly Ugandan quality series that I could tune into at my heart's content? And just throw in some words of Luganda, so my boss wouldn't even know what it was if the thing slipped out. So... I started to write a script. It was meant to be a movie because I wasn't very sure if we could have a TV series. So I said to write what I would think would be a movie to be uploaded onto the web. So I wrote and wrote and wrote and then I decided to present it to my business partner. How am I doing on time? Okay. So I decided to present it to my business partner and he read it and he said, you know what, Nana? Um, what do you envision? I told him, you know what? I envision quality. I envision edgy. I envision everything in Uganda that's not a tragedy. It's not land grabbing. It's not wife swapping. Despite everything that we do have, we as Ugandans are, to me, a very interesting bunch of people. Our stories are not told based on Nigerians or any other African. So I thought to myself, once he read it, he said, you know what? For longevity, we have to turn this into a series. So I was tasked with breaking it down. So I wrote an entire season while I worked. I'm a mother to two kids. And the third one is in my stomach. I'm still a wife. So when they went to bed, I'd work until 2 a.m. But I wanted this really badly. So I pushed myself in between jobs and everything that I had to do. I could, you know, I kept focusing on that red carpet. You know that Angelina leg with a gown and myself giving that speech? It is such an attractive vision in anyone's head. So it kept me going. And I wrote the first season of Beneath the Lies. We cast um, the people that we thought were, I would say to me, I, I won't say accomplished, but people that had paid their dues in the industry, that were capable of turning up on time and showing professionalism. So we cast those. Then we tried to find a production crew, and that was hard. So we imported some people from Kenya. I don't know how many of you know about Beneath the Lies. It all went pear-shaped, and that production was sold in after two episodes. Everything was taken from the cables to the sockets to the footage, even the backup footage in the safes was taken. We had nothing. 
period. I mean, everything. Um, I don't know anyone who does productions in Uganda, but someone either believes in you or you are self-funded. We went the self-funded route. And God bless my husband. He kept the ship running at home. But my money was being funneled into Beneath the Lights. And suddenly it was all gone on the 29th of December. We had nothing. We couldn't even face the TV station that we had done this deal with. So it took a lot of um, soul searching to actually face ourselves and start looking at our mistakes. Like Tessa said, you know, failure is not a mistake. It's a lesson. It's looking back on everything that you could have done right and you didn't. Because I don't think that we would be where we are now if Beneath the Lights had taken off as it did. So we, I regrouped with Cedric and we sat down with no money and we thought to ourselves, this has to go on. So we started doing little things. It's amazing. Success is the little things you do every day. It's going back into the scripts you wrote and changing certain things that didn't feel right at the time, but you didn't have time. It's waking up in the morning and researching people that do um, sort of funding or investments. It's basically going to people you know and telling them if you contribute even $100, it will go a long way. So it's been a while and a lot of self-belief, but Beneath the Lights comes back on air in June. We start shooting soon with a fully Ugandan production crew that we had disregarded before. Okay, it's that sort of, I wouldn't say arrogance or superiority or whatever. It's always, I've learned a lot of things in production that I never would have learned as a scientist. We don't believe in ourselves as Ugandans. When you think quality, you think abroad. I'm a victim of that. That's what I thought. I thought, you know what? We can't get this sort of quality. But to this day, every single one of my crew and cast is Ugandan, and they're more than capable. In fact, they have superseded anything I've ever seen before. And I am a very critical person. So when you ask yourself every single day about what is going to happen if you risk enough, what um, you can't achieve, what is standing in your way, what you don't have money for your dream, you can't do it because someone else is more privileged, you're not going to go against the grain because you have A, B, C, and D, your family won't support you, your friends won't support you. You have to find that place in your heart that believes in you. No one else knows you better than you. Nobody knows you better than you. Don't let anyone ever take away the gift you've been given, and that's your capability and your intellect. It is very simple to hide under something and say, I can't. I can't is the easiest word anyone can ever say. But I live by the credo that impossible is just a word. If you give yourself permission to dream, you can do anything. Every single person we all look up to probably started from where we are, but they believed enough. They believed that the dots would join. And they did. At some point, God is an amazing thing, a person or an entity. That belief that we have in God, I'm not saying measure about that belief about yourself, but that belief you have in God or whatever spiritual connection you have with your, your whatever you worship. If you can take a quarter of that and believe in who you are, because no one else is like you. You are not going to trade your path like me. I can only stand here and give you a testimony. Okay. But anything you do, you have to map your way. And it's not a race, it's a journey. Enjoy it. I can stand up here and I can look like things were easy for me. I, d I can't, in all honesty, give you the map. But what I can do is tell you every time you get that self-doubt, pick yourself up and do something. Do a little something that takes you closer to what you want to be. Okay? So, I don't know if I've digressed, if I've spoken in any way, shape, or form that I don't mean to inspire. I'm not a teacher. I can only give you pointers, and I can only give you from my own experiences. But I do hope that at some point you can take away something and use it to map your own way in this world. Thank you so much for being an amazing audience. <laughs> okay.